The MiG-29 is over 40 years old, but is still one of the fastest fighter jets in the world. It can reach Mach 2.3 or 1320 knots, while the F-22 Raptor, which is also super fast, only reaches Mach 2.25 or 1303 knots. Being so fast, it must be very aerodynamic. So how does it break the sound barrier? What kind of shocks are forming? To find out, we simulated it at Mach 0.9 to see what happens when it goes transonic, and we also simulated it at Mach 0.5 to see how its aerodynamics differ when it's well below the speed of sound. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any data on the MiG-29 going supersonic, so we have nothing to compare the CFD to. But the CFD method is the same one that we've been using in our other supersonic videos, like the Eurofighter Typhoon Hero. So you can decide on the method's accuracy yourself. This is at max 0.5, and this is a center plane showing the flow in meters per second. One thing that really stands out compared to modern fighter jets is that the MiG-29 still has a quintessential needle on its nose. And that alone makes this plane a really interesting one because it is very much a combination of traditional supersonic design and modern supersonic design. For example, that needle is very much a traditional element, and we covered them more in detail when we did the Bell X-1 in this video. But along with that, the MiG-29 also has twin vertical stabilizers, which, among other things, reduces radar cross-sectional area. That is much more modern. We will see later some more modern tech, but first, you can see in this plane just how well the needle works. By looking at the coloring around it, notice how it doesn't change at all. Only very close to it do we see some changes. Those changes are just the boundary layer forming, and the lack of change in color around it tells us that it isn't disturbing the flow really at all, at least not enough to tell from this plot. That describes what the needle was made for to begin with. Needles were placed on the front of supersonic planes to pierce the shockwave that forms ahead of the plane. To do that, you want to disturb the flow as little as possible, because the more it disturbs the flow, the more drag will be on it, and then it will be harder to pierce the shock. So because here it makes no difference to the flow, we can be quite confident that it's very well designed and will pierce the shocks forming ahead of the plane, and we'll confirm that later. Moving to the nose, we now see why needles were placed here to begin with. Look at how much the flow decelerates as you hit the nose. Speeds down to 130 meters per second occur. So the nose is really impacting the flow, and that means that if you were to try to pierce a shockwave without the needle, there'd be much more drag and wave drag from it. Then progressing over the nose, the flow speeds up with very small regions of flow over 200 meters per second. If this trend continues, there should be some shocks there when we look at Mach 0.9. We also get huge deceleration in front of the canopy because the canopy is actually pretty blunt. It's sloped at around 45 degrees, which is because of visibility, but that also comes with a lot of energy loss here too. And if we look at the same plane, but colored in the pressure, we see there is very high pressure here as the high speed flow from upstream slams into the canopy. That's not great for drag. Now over the canopy, we get the exact same trend we saw for the Eurofighter where the flow accelerates like crazy and that comes with a massive drop in pressure. So this low pressure is actually trying to pull the canopy off. The reason why we get so much flow acceleration is really just plain old aerodynamics, where you have a curved body and the flow remains attached over it. As a result, it accelerates and then as it passes, decelerates, much like the flow over a wing. Take note of this very high velocity region because that will be important when the plane goes transonic. Underneath, there are some very small regions of very slow flow. Those are effectively wakes and stagnation flows as they hit the various protuberances underneath. And actually, I'm a little surprised that they don't come with relatively large changes in the pressure. I mean, the velocity drops a lot, so I kind of expect some higher pressure, assuming that these are stagnation flows. But because the pressure doesn't increase that much, Perhaps they are more small wakes. Or maybe it's a combination of both the stagnation pressures and wakes cancelling each other out to some extent, where the wake from one of the protuberances just upstream cancels out the stagnation pressure just downstream. From here, the rest of the plane is largely uneventful. Some minor drops in the velocity occur between the vertical stabilizers and underneath near the nozzles. But in terms of the pressure, look at how much more of the upper surface is exposed to those blue, low pressure flow compared to underneath. That tells us that the MiG is using most of its body, at least in the center plane, to produce lift. These simulations were done with open foam. If you're interested in learning open foam, check out our courses here. Now that we've seen the MiG's aerodynamics at max 0.5, 
Let's now look at this exact same plane, but at Mach 0.9, transonic. And the great thing is that the aerodynamic features don't really change, they're just exaggerations of what we saw at Mach 0.5. For example, we still get major deceleration ahead of the nose, but the acceleration parts over the nose correspond to sonic flow. So these are the first shocks forming on the plane's surface, and now we actually reach another point that shows the modern design of the MiG. So back when people were first trying to break the sound barrier, knowledge of shock waves was very limited, as you might expect. Large shocks were created over the plane, and the underlying idea was to try to part the shocks, kind of like trying to squeeze the plane through the shocks. Since then, the far more popular approach is to not create large shocks, but rather make many smaller shocks around the plane. Each one of these shocks is then weaker and dies out much sooner, so the rest of the plane doesn't have to deal with them. Here on the nose, we get this exact same design philosophy in action. Many smaller shocks are forming, but they don't penetrate into the flow very much. Along with the rest of the front of the plane, we get various other shocks, including just one in front of the canopy. I mean, the velocity doesn't seem to move that high, but it definitely has a shock pattern to it, and the pressure also drops suddenly. And I think that I know why we get a shock wave here at such a slow speed. To show why, we have to look at the air density in this plane. So the air density is plotted from 1 kilo per cubic meter to 1.3 kilos in blue to yellow respectively. The key thing to note is that as the air density increases, the speed of sound drops. That means that at 1.3 kilos per cubic meter, in order for shocks to form, you don't need to reach as high a speed. And that is exactly what is happening here. Ahead of the canopy, the density is very yellow, so around 1.3. That's around 10% higher than the free stream flow. As such, even though we're only seeing a speed of around 270 meters per second, that's enough to reach the speed of sound. Now the reason why we get such a high density here in the first place is because the canopy is compressing the flow. Because it shoots up so sharply, the flow has to turn upwards suddenly, and that has upstream consequences. Remember that this is transonic and not supersonic, so some upstream effects can still occur. If this was completely supersonic, then nothing could propagate upstream. Anyway, moving to over the canopy, the flow accelerates a lot as it did at Mach 0.5, but now it's easily fast enough to break the sound barrier and we get three small but very distinct shocks. From here, the flow actually mimics the Mach 0.5 case very well, unexpectedly well because the flow doesn't accelerate enough. And actually, the flow here stands less chance of accelerating than at Mach 0.5 because upstream, the shocks we do get are taking some energy out of the flow, so downstream, there's less energy to work with. That was the center plane, and while we get some key features here, Let's move away from the center line. Now we see a lot more action here. Just note that this plane is for Mach 0.9 and it's one meter to the left of the center line. We do see a lot more action here. Just note that this location isn't actually through the wings yet, but through the portion of the fuselage that has been flattened out to still produce lift, but it's still a distinct and separate region to the wings. The fuselage also has leading edge extensions that join the wings. So to begin with, underneath the fuselage, we see three distinct small shocks forming. Now, their current location is actually ideal because it helps compress the air before it enters the engine's inlet. But if those shocks migrate back more, it would be bad for the engine because the inlet would now swallow them and that will make the compressor perform worse. Now, the reason why that's bad is because the efficiency of a turbofan engine and any engine in the turbojet family is directly proportional to the compression ratio. The greater the ratio is, the more efficient the entire engine will be. So if any shocks impact the compressor, that will reduce its performance, which will then reduce the compression ratio across it, and that will reduce the entire engine's efficiency. It's really amazing how an entire engine's efficiency can be approximated quite accurately by literally just the compression ratio. I know that this was really complicated, but let's leave that now and move to over the wings. We get several small shocks over the wings, with perhaps the most notable being between the two fins. But one thing that's important to me is that if you look at the pressure plot, you can see that there's no low pressure zone just behind the leading edge. The reason why that's important is because this plane is at zero degrees, but it has leading edge extensions and highly swept wings too. But here, it shows that at zero degrees, the leading edge extensions don't produce any vortices yet. You really need to pitch up to start getting some. If you look at the same plane, but at max 0.5, here the flow over the wing isn't as indicative of what the flow will be at max 0.9. If we zoom in, 
there are some regions of slight flow acceleration, but they are marginal. So it would be a little less clear that shocks would form here too. But still, if all you had was the data from this flow speed, you could get some idea as to what would happen at transonic speeds. Let's now move to over the wing. This plane is two meters to the left of the center line and at max 0.9. At the leading edge, over the top of the wing, we get really fast moving flow. It seems like there are shocks there too, but looking at the pressure, I also think that we're getting some vortex forming because we get a low pressure core and it's in the right location too for it to be a vortex lift. So it seems like even at zero degrees, this wing might be producing the early stages of vortex lift. That's unexpected because usually you need to pitch to get vortex lift and the MiG definitely does have all the geometric ingredients needed for vortex lift like the sharp leading edge, it's naturally curved downwards and it's also swept, but it still doesn't make much sense here. But we'll look later at some more details. Now I don't want to go through that just yet because it might be a little confusing just to jump from here to another plane. Just remember that it's weird here that we're getting some early formation of vortex lift. Now let's move on to one really nice part, which is the tail. There's flow acceleration over it, but no shocks. That's impressive. The reason why it isn't producing shocks here is likely because at this angle, the wake from the wing is flowing right into the tail's leading edge. So the tail is actually seeing the slower flow, which means that it won't be able to hit transonic speeds as easily. Just quickly, looking at the temperature here on the pressure side of the wing, at the leading edge, the temperature is like 330 Kelvin, and then literally a few centimeters away on the suction surface, the temperature has dropped to below freezing. So if you were to sit on the wing at max 0.9, you'd be freezing, but then if you were to reposition a few centimeters underneath, you'd be boiling. So remember that in this plane, which is two meters off the center, it's weird that we're getting vortex lift, or at least it seems like we're getting it. Well, if we jump to this plane, and that's now three meters to the left of the center line, aha. Uh -huh. We don't get any semblance of vortex lift. It's the exact same wing, perhaps a slightly different profile, but it should still give us something. Well, I think what this is showing is that the wing itself at zero degrees doesn't produce vortex lift. What happened in the two meter plane was that at this location, it's very close to the leading edge extension. And that's where it meets the wing really. So the flow from the leading edge extension is now causing a local flow angularity and that is inducing minor vortex lift at this specific location only. That all makes sense now. I can sleep better. Back to the three meter plane, we get quite a few shocks over the wing and even over the horizontal stabilizer. So the leading edge extension was really good for the flow. We have some other cut planes, but they show mainly the same stuff. So let's move on to the pressure over the top of the wing and stabilizer. This is the right wing. The shock structures are very complex and it really highlights how the MiG designers embrace the idea of many smaller shocks instead of fewer larger ones. The tail also features some shocks, but one major difference between the wing shock and the tail shocks is that the shocks over the wing typically span the entire span. They usually don't appear locally. Over the tail, it's 50-50, with the leading edge shocks spanning the entire span, but once we get past them, the shocks seem much more localized. So to sum up everything, we have this final video that shows the high speed regions. There's widespread high speed flow and likely sonic flow over the wings and in between the fins. By comparison, underneath is fairly uneventful with most high speed flow and shocks forming around the store's mount as expected. That is the aerodynamics of this incredible MiG-29 as it breaks the sound barrier. Peace out amigos.